Daily Bread drive through is back. Sorry for the delay. My desk gets so mad scientist style. Um, that's just how I work best. I mean, right now, uh, there are 20 books on my desk, uh, and that's how I like it. You know, when the brain's running, creative juices are flowing, that's what it is. So we're back with the Daily Bread drive through um, Took a little bit of a break um, for the last, I guess, I don't know, 10 days. And um, remember, my intention was to come back last week, um, but I just was like, wow, I need this sabbatical, you know, not to mention that uh, I really need to put some time into my book, uh, which will be dropping any day. Uh, details will be following. I did have copies yesterday. Um, thanks for all those who are just supporting it so strongly, so um, uh, with so much joy. You know, um, it's coming out in paperback. In a month, it will be coming out in hardback, uh, hardcover. Uh, and then also I did an audio book so you can actually sit and read it and then listen to me actually uh, doing the audio book which will be available on audible and on Apple music um, also uh, took last week to really get started with this level up documentary uh, as you've heard me share by God's grace we um, spearheaded what became the largest outreach movement in the region uh, to uh, at-risk unchurched teens and young adults are uh, reaching up to 300. Um, how real uh, is this ministry and how much of a crisis are our youth in Philadelphia in? Um, there are people, you know, over the holidays, you know, who attended our events who were murdered. You know, I believe Philadelphia reached 500 homicides um, uh, just at the close of the new year. Uh, so we're working on a movie which is going to be to show the power of God, the power of love in action, the power of the gospel, um, to show and to humanize these beautiful, amazing young people who we are still continuing to serve weekly. Uh, thank you for those who just support this mission, uh, those who come out and just get their hearts touched because uh, it's so easy to fall in love with them. They are indeed diamonds in the rough. Um, and it's also really to raise awareness because a lot of people who live in Philadelphia don't know Philadelphia. Uh, it's just it's just reality, uh, and that ha you learn by getting on the front lines. You learn from being a part of that nonprofit, being a part of that organization, um, even if you're that's your professional space of just being on the front lines to learn. But then it's our job to blow the clarion call and to raise the awareness with others. Everyone is needed in this, you know? So we have those who are on the front lines raising the clarion call. We have those that are in other spaces able to support those on the front lines. God is glorified. Everyone's doing their part. Boom, that's enough of that. Let's get into the Bible uh, because we have a lot to go through today. Uh, we are in the book of Revelation. Annie, is the family on board? All right, they're on board. Uh, my daughter and I, uh, you know, we bond in many ways, but one of the ways we bond is through Daily Bread drive through While different members of my family do record, she is really my roadie. She is the one who is right there. We get it popping, you know what I mean? Um, so I won't tell y'all that she's a sleepyhead. I won't say that, but she is up and she is ready when it's time to do Daily Bread. Boom. So we're in the book of Revelation. Um... I will just say, I personally would kick myself if I look back at my life right now and saw that I wasn't in the book of Revelation. Let me say that one more time. I personally would kick myself if I were able to look back at this time period right now and saw myself here and saw myself doing a lot of other things, even studying other things and not studying the book of Revelation. It's the only book that promises a blessing to the ones that read it, to the ones that keep it. The Greek word in Revelation chapter 1 verse 3 is to guard it, um, to treasure it. Um, Revelation is the book that explains itself, right? Remember in John chapter 21, when Jesus prophesies and says to Peter, you know, when you were young, you would walk where you wanted. You would essentially, uh, basically uh, dress yourself the way you wanted. But when you are older, you will walk somewhere you would not have walked. And someone will put something on you that you would not put on yourself. Speaking of him being crucified on a cross, right? Peter immediately looks and says, well, what about John? Jesus says in John chapter 21, what is it to you 
if John tarries or stays alive until I return, you follow me. Don't worry about John's lane. Worry about your lane. And Peter did finish well. Uh, that's why you even see in Second Peter, he even says, you know, basically, I know that my time of uh, being martyred is coming near, you know, basically, as the Lord has shown me. Second Peter chapter 1, verse 14, knowing that shortly I must put off my earthly tabernacle, even as our Lord Jesus Christ has showed me. Peter embraced it, but Jesus was right. When he said to Peter, what if John stays alive until I return? Having said that, John was the only disciple who wasn't martyred. In fact, he was sent to this island of Patmos, which was a chain gang island. When Caesar tried to martyr him, tried to kill him, uh, he put him in a vat of boiling oil, tradition says. And when John was unscathed, just like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, God never changes, he sent him to Patmos, this forlorn chain gang prison island where you were sent to die. Well, interestingly, John only stayed there, tradition says, for about a year and a half. But while he was there, he receives the revelation of Jesus Christ. Um, we've talked about how when you are in your Patmos, when you are just basically in this forlorn, unfamiliar, desolate, seemingly uninhabited, monotonous, uh, grueling place that looks nothing like where you imagined you would be, that is when you need to realize that he, the good shepherd, has led you in all places and that you are there for a purpose. Our Patmoses are to prepare us for something else. Our Patmoses are for us to get closer to the Lord and also to have our mind blown and ever learn to stop putting God in the boxes. We're so good at putting them in any way. Revelation is the book that explains itself. Uh, it says in Revelation chapter 1, um, verse revelation 1 verse 19 he says write the things that you have seen john that's chapter one write the things that currently are john that's chapters two and three the seven letters to the seven churches write the things that will be here after that's revelation four through 19 um we are looking at the things that are we're looking at the second section of the book of revelation chapter one is section one Chapters 2 and 3 are section 2. Chapters 4 through 22 are section 3. As we look at these seven letters to the seven churches, he gives seven real churches. While John is on that island, on that prison island, there were seven real churches in Asia Minor, in Turkey. Seven real churches, right? He's going to have him write seven letters, a letter to each of these seven churches. These letters are seven x-rays. These letters are seven report cards. If we want to know, it says in Romans 14, verse 10, it says in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 10, that we're going to stand in front of Jesus and give an account for what we individually have done with our Christian walk, with our uh, pilgrimage here. Have we lived for self or lived for Jesus? Have we lived religiously like a Pharisee or have we lived sensitive to the spirit? Has what we've done been out of a real spiritual motive or has it been out of selfish motives? Uh, have we just been following the world, just all about numbers and bottom lines or have we really been about souls? Have we really wanted to obey God in the core of our heart? If we want to know what it's like to give an account before the Lord and what it's going to be like, read Revelation 2 and 3. It's like being given a practice test before the test. It's like being given a practice MCAT before the MCAT, a practice LSAT before the LSAT. You can read Revelation, the seven letters, and hold yourself up to them and really see where you're at on every issue. Seven is the number of completion. If you take these seven letters and put them together, it is the complete x-ray for any person, for any local church, for any organization uh, of churches, the universal church, the global church, period. Yo, I'm ready to get it started. Annie, ready? We're going to dive in. Today we're in the third letter. It's the letter to Pergamos, all right? It's the letter to Pergamos. We looked at the first letter, Revelation chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. That was the letter to Ephesus. That was the church that had lost its first love. So busy about the king's business. So busy about the apologetics and the bulletin and everything being right and the worship team. And everything looked great. So busy about the king's business that they had neglected 
intimate time with the king, so busy about doing the work that they were not realizing and celebrating and remembering that Christ was right there in the middle to be adored, to have the spike nard of our hearts anointed, poured over him, to kiss his feet and to wash his feet with our hair. We can't lose that intimacy with Jesus. Otherwise, the rest of the work will begin to suffer. Boom. Second church was the letter to the church at Smyrna, Revelation chapter 2, verses 8 through 11. That's the suffering church. This was a church that uh, was seemingly holding on by a thread, financially poor. But he says to that church, you're rich. Interesting, while so many churches today are gauging what does it mean to be a healthy church, this church actually, I wonder by today's standards, might have been called a fledgling church or a church that nobody was really interested in. Smyrna is one of the only churches Jesus has nothing negative to say about it. Hmm, let's process that. So now on to Pergamos. Pergamos was about 60 miles north of Smyrna, okay? Um, let me read it first. He says, to the angel, to the messenger, basically to the lead pastor of the church in Pergamos, write this. These things, says he, that has the sharp sword with two edges. Remember, in Revelation 1, John sees Jesus in high priestly glory. If you want to know what it's going to look like when we see Jesus, read Revelation 1. That, that's how we're going to see him uh, to where even though we know him, we are going to fall before him uh, like a wet rag, you know. But he says to John, fear not. From the description of Jesus in Revelation 1, Jesus takes bits of that description for whatever each local church needs to focus on. So for the church that lost its first love, Ephesus, he reminds them that he's the one that walks in the middle of the lampstands. He's the one that's walking in the middle of the church, even while he's being ignored as far as intimacy and true adoration. To the church at Smyrna, he reminds them he's the one who died, who went to the uttermost limits of sorrow and resurrected and conquered death to the church at Smyrna uh, at per Pergamos they got it's if Ephesus is the church that lost its first love if Smyrna is the church that's suffering Pergamos is the church that's tolerating compromise this church is tolerating compromise he tells that church that he's the one that has the sharp sword with the two edges coming out of his mouth. It's referring to the same sword that comes out of his mouth at the second coming in Revelation 19. It is the verbal judgment. I am the one who just my word is the judgment. My word is the word you need to fear. Reminds you of when Jesus talks in Matthew 25 about at his return, he will separate the sheep no, uh, nations from the goat nations, and he will say to the goat nations, depart from me, you know, and to the wicked, depart from me. I never knew you. Matthew chapter 7, verse 22. Lord Jesus, we knew you. You know, we did miracles in your name. We preached, we did ministry. Depart from me. I never knew you. That is the sharp sword of two edges. That is the worst thing every human should fear is that verbal judgment. This is so serious at Pergamos. He's saying, I am the one with that verbal judgment. I am the amen. I have that word, that word of judgment that you don't want to hear and you better get it right. Yo, this is sobering. Already you can feel, right? So to the angel of the church at Pergamos, write this. These things says he that has the sharp sword with the two edges. I know your works. The Lord knows all of what we do. He knows the awesome work. He knows every uh, sweat uh, that is dropped. He knows every teardrop that is shed. Um, it says in the Psalms, he even collects our tears in a bottle. He says, I know. I know your works. I know where you dwell. Pergamos was a tough city. It was a tough nut to crack, a tough place to do ministry. I love that he's saying, I know where you dwell. I think of the work we do in West Philly and the work we do in greater Philadelphia. Philadelphia, the poorest of the 10 largest cities in the country. Philadelphia, more teenagers doing life than any other city in America. Uh, it has been said more incarcerated teens than anywhere in the world. Our homicide rate just near topping 500. It's tough. But the Lord says, I know where you dwell. I know. I know what you got going on there. Okay, let's keep reading. 
I even know where Satan's seat is. We're going to come back to that. And you hold fast my name, he's saying, and you have not denied my faith, even in the days wherein Antipas was my faithful martyr who was slain among you where Satan dwells. Something is so dark about the city of Pergamos, where this church is getting it on, that the Lord names twice as it being a place where Satan sits on the throne. That is, that's crazy. Let's keep reading. He says, this is all the good stuff you have going on. But verse 14, I have a few things against you because, underline this, you have their them. Notice that. He doesn't say you're doing it. You notice he just talked about some faithful believers in verse 13. But he says in verse 14, this is what I have against you though. While you're getting it on for the Lord, you have in your company, in your church assembly, them that do what? Them that are doing wrong. So this is the church that's tolerating compromise. Here's the question. Okay, you're getting it on for the Lord. Okay, you watch Daily Bread drive through Okay, you get it on. Yo, do you know how to challenge a brother? Challenge a sister? Rebuke a brother? Rebuke a sister? Tell someone you're dead wrong? What are you doing? That sounds like a bunch of excuses. Yo, you're really dancing with the world. What's really good? Come on, Jesus loves us. He loves me. He loves us. Let's do this. Do okay, yo, are you really Christianity is not about you doing your thing and to each his own live and let live. That's the world. But why is the church today getting caught up in this live and let live? Like, yo, man, I, I'm good. My daily reading is good. I'm good. I'm good. Yo, but you know someone else isn't living right. You know they're not getting it in for the Lord. You know that they're basically to tolerating and mingling with all kinds of worldly doctrines, and you don't say nothing. That's what he's saying to the church at Pergamos. Let's keep reading. You have their them. You're tolerating in your company. Faithful are the wounds of a friend. Greater love has no man than this that he lay down his life for his brother. You're just allowing people right next to you to live whack. And you're not saying nothing. Okay? You have their them that hold the doctrine of Balaam. Who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel. To eat things sacrificed unto idols and to commit fornication. You also, verse uh, 15, have there them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which I hate. This is interesting because it's the second time we see the doctrine of the Nicolaitans show up. Notice in the church of Ephesus in Revelation 2, verse 6, he just says, you guys hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans. The church of Pergamos, he's like, yo, y'all are walking in. Never mind just the deeds. Never mind just a little bit of uh, just, yo, you remind me of something that's not healthy. It says that the church of Pergamos, you, you're teaching the doctrine. You're allowing people in there that basically are holding to bad doctrines, worldly doctrines, doctrines of different worldviews, doctrines that do nothing but pull you down. Uh, and it is the opposite of growth in Christ. He says, repent. He's telling two people to repent. Those of you that don't know how to challenge people, repent. Those of you doing wrong, repent. Or else I will come against you quickly, and I will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. Uh, he that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. To him that overcomes, I will give to eat of the hidden manna, and I will give him a white stone, and in that stone a new name written, which no man knows except he that receives it. Okay, would you guys like to go deeper now? Should we, we, we've touched on it. We've just really had an intro thus far. Do we really go deeper now? You ready to go deeper? Any, they want to go deeper? I think they want to go deeper. All right, they, all right. You, you're not sure? You said you think or you know? They, they want to go deeper. All right, let's go. All right. He, let's go back to verse 12. To the angel of the church in Pergamos. Let's talk about Pergamos really quick. Pergamos, 60 miles north of Smyrna, also in Asia Minor, a.k.a. Turkey. Pergamos was a very rich city, but not because of commerce, not because of trade. It was the religious center. Nimrod from Genesis chapter 10, building the Tower of Babel, 
the first attempt at a one world government where so much of occult and numerology and uh, astrology uh, and started the whole thing um, of Nimrod, his wife Semiramis, his son Tammuz, which became the unholy trinity, which you see carried on in Greece with Osiris, Isis, and Horus, which you see carried on and all the way through and then all the way down to the exaltation of the queen of heaven, which is just a reframing of Isis when you see the virgin mother Mary holding the baby Jesus. Where am I going with this? Pergamos was that city that, see, Babylon was, I mean, the Tower of Babel and Nimrod was in Babylon. The priest that kept the secrets of all of Nimrod's mystery religions were in Babylon. When Nebuchadnezzar was there, when Daniel was there, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were there. The priests kept those secrets from Nimrod. When Babylon got smashed by the Persians, those priests went to Pergamos. Pergamos was the religious center. That's why there was so much money there. It was a wealthy city. It, that's why you see the Lord saying, I know where Satan's throne is. Basically, Pergamos had this altar to Zeus. It was one of the seven wonders of the world. Uh, it was this giant altar to Zeus. Uh, it was an intellectual center, had one of the largest libraries in the world. Actually, the word parchment comes from Pergamos, comes from the word Pergamos. It was a medical center where they worshipped the medical, uh, the god of medicine, the patron god of the city, actually. Even though this had this large altar to Zeus, the patron god of the city was uh, Aesculapius. Aesculapius, that's actually where we get the word scalpel. Uh, Aesculapius was represented as the two snakes intertwining the pole, uh, which is what we still see today on the backs of ambulances and different things. That actually is an image of Aesculapius, which was the medical, the god of uh, medicine and the chief uh, deity of Pergamos, okay? So, um, it was basically one of the greatest centers of false worldviews in the world. So no wonder believers, they were being persecuted. No wonder believers, uh, and we even read, let's read again, to the angel of the church in Pergamos, write this. These things says he that has the sharp sword with the two edges. I know your works. I know you're laboring there. Hebrews chapter six, verse 10. God is not unfaithful to forget your labors of love. God does not forget what you do. 1 Corinthians 15, 58. Be ye therefore steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord as you know your labor is not in vain. You know, you see a lot of believers quit ministry as though their labor's been in vain. You see a lot of believers complain about serving as though their labor was in vain. A lot of believers talk the very opposite of what the Bible says. Do you know you should be celebrating every nanosecond you get to serve for the Lord? Every nanosecond, every penny you get to give, it should be a celebration. It's not a got to, it's a get to. The psalmist said, I'd rather be a doorkeeper in God's house than to live in the best mansions in Beverly Hills. All right. So he says, I know your works. I know where you dwell. And I know where Satan's seat is. And I know that you hold fast my name and you've not denied my faith. Interesting. When it says that you hold fast my name, it doesn't just mean that you're keeping the name of Jesus on the tip of your tongue. It doesn't just mean 1 Peter 3.15. You're ready to always give an answer to every man that asks for the hope that you have with meekness and trembling. It doesn't mean that. It means you're intimately holding on to me. You're, you're holding to my character. Please write down Isaiah 51, verse 10. It says, who is there among you who's walking in darkness? Because this church was going through it as far as persecution. Who is there among you that walks in the darkness, that's going through the darkness and has no light? Stay on the name of your God. The name there means the character. When you don't know what's going on in your life, that medical test you don't know the result of, that job you don't know if it's going to come through, uh, you don't know where next month's mortgage is going to get paid. You just don't know what 2021 holds. When you don't know what is going on, hold on to what you do know, the character of God. That's what Isaiah 51.10 is saying. Who's there among you who walks in darkness and has no light? 
Let him stay on the name of his God. Stay means rest on his character, his goodness, his faithfulness, his grace, his love, his omnipotence, his omnipresence. Come on, let's keep it moving. So he says, you've not denied my name and you've not denied my faith. Even in those days wherein Antipas, underline his name, was my faithful martyr who was slain among you where Satan dwells. A, a, a believer was martyred there. A believer was martyred there. His name was Antipas. Was Antipas his real name? Because you know what Antipas means? It means against all. Anti, against, all. Pass means all. I think he was given that name. Because whoever this dude was, he was so sold out. He was against all that was opposed to the word of God. Against all that was opposed to real spiritual uh, Christianity. He was against all Phariseeism, legalism, worldly Christianity, lukewarm Christianity. We think against all just means the stuff in the world. Yo, there's moralists that are even against the stuff that's negative in the world. He was against all that was opposed to the heart of Christ. I think all of us can be an antipass. Who today is willing to be an antipass? An antipass even when it means in speaking against compromise even within the church. Against all doesn't just mean, oh, I'm against all worldviews that don't line up with truth. Yo, what about within the professing community when people are just are not walking it? And they're not, and we are all called to be against all. Yo, we got to iron sharpen iron. It says, Antipas was martyred among you where Satan dwells. Yo, they're in a tough spot. They're ministering in a tough spot. Here's the reality. This is a church that's tolerating compromise. But yo, the people that were getting it in were getting it in. And before the Lord rebukes them for not challenging the brother to their right, for not challenging the sister to their left, he is highlighting they were getting it in. They are ministering in perhaps the toughest ministry context of all of what we will read in these seven letters. A tougher ministry context than Ephesus, a tougher ministry context than Smyrna, a tougher ministry context than Thyatira, a tougher ministry context than Philadelphia, a tougher ministry context than Sardis, a tougher ministry context than Laodicea. And the Lord's saying, I know that. Yo, maybe you're ministering in a tougher ministry context than your friends. Maybe you're ministering in a tougher ministry context than your friend at a church right down the street. Because you could be in a tough ministry context and use all the terms that are cool and not even be doing anything. But yo, for those of you that are in a tough ministry context, celebrate it. Praise God for it. Praise God. You know, there was a man named Titus. Paul sent Titus to Crete because Crete, an uh, island uh, in the middle of the Mediterranean, they, they had stuff that was just going wrong. Titus wanted to leave, man. It wasn't his idea of ministry. Yo, are you in ministry right now and it's not your idea of what you thought ministry would be? Ministering to people that you didn't think you'd be ministering to? And you could be tempted to quit? Yo, <laughs> Paul writes a letter back to him. We have it in the book of Titus. And he says, yo, <laughs> you talk about leaving? You talking about bailing? <laughs> What do you think I left you there for, Titus 1.5? For this reason, I left you in Crete. <laughs> I didn't send you there because it was sweet. I sent you there because it was tough and stuff needed fixing. What you, it's like he's saying, what do you think I left you there for? Look, look at our ministry context. Room. What do you think the Lord left us here for? Oh, it's tough. Oh, I don't know what's going on. I only really know. Dave, the Lord told you sufficient unto the day is the, is, the, is the evil thereof. One day is enough of his own problems. Yo, do you see a hungry person in front of you? A person that needs to hear the gospel? Yo, tons of them. The field is white unto harvest. Yo, what do you, yo, what do you think he left you there for? Titus 1.5. For this cause I left you in Crete, that you should set in order <laughs> the things that are off and ordain elders in every city as I appointed you. Titus, you talk about leaving. What do you think I left you there for? Yo, we got to go. I'll be back tomorrow. And look, we're going to dive in Pergamos so hard. Uh, there's a lot we're going to look at. Yo, please like and share. Let people know Daily Bread drive Through is back. See you tomorrow at noon. Like and share. That's how we spread this thing. Spread the word. Share it. Encourage people to jump on. Yo, don't be that one that tolerates compromise. Maybe you're getting it on, but you know a lot of people that need to be in the word. Oh, I'm just too busy. It's not my thing. But wait, Matthew chapter 6 says, give us this day our daily bread. Psalm 1 promises a blessing on the person that meditates on the word day and night. Yo, start today 
by challenging someone else. Don't be like the one in Pergamos who you might be getting it on for the Lord, but the Lord wants to rebuke you because you don't challenge people that you know need to be in their word, need to be doubted about it. I got to go salute.